Well, this is, um, I guess, let me, maybe I'll start a little bit, a little gently, because I think people are still filtering in. Um, the, again, my name is Steve Skeena. Um, I am the uh, instructor of CSE 519. This is the data science, the introduction to data science class. Um, and again, I want to give it a, another, slow down for just a minute more, because uh, I think people may be having issues coming in the first day. One of the things that I'll say in a data science class is that you want to look at distributions and how distributions um, shape up. What is, do we think, actually it's funny, I'm sitting here wanting to think about a distribution of what is the number of people in the class as a function of time. So the x-axis is time, the y-axis is frequency, okay, and um, let's say this is the expected time that class would start, okay? What would the shape of that distribution look like, okay? If I'm gonna to try to take a guess, at what, uh, that's one reason why I'm enjoying looking at the, at the number of participants, because I'm kind of curious about this. Um, my guess is it probably looks something like this, okay? That again, as we expect that as we get very, very that, that the number of people involved at the beginning, there's a small number of people. It grows extremely rapidly, okay, as the time of class approaches, but doesn't reach a peak until after the class has started. Okay. In general, we would like people to be here on time, but that's kind of true. And if we want to go a little further, um, we probably expect that with time, after people go in, eventually they're going to start to lose interest. And then at the end of the subclass, it will uh, drop when I finally end lecture. And I guess that you can't see, maybe there. Okay, any questions, uh, uh, any, um, I don't know if that's a very profound observation, but it's giving me a chance to play with the tools, give people a little bit more time to come in. And um, let me start, uh, you know, use this opportunity to try to start lecture now. Um, okay, boom. Let me try to move on to the next slide. Okay, so first of all, like I said, my name is Steve Skeena. I would like to welcome you to uh, this data science course. Um, my TA, uh, one thing that I want maybe as an announcement beforehand that I'll emphasize a little later is that this is my first time ever teaching on Zoom. And uh, I am you know, somewhat terrified of this for many reasons. Um, one is that uh, I find it's gonna be very, very difficult to teach without getting feedback from people. So it's important to me that I see, um, what you call it, that I see uh, that, that people fe feel free to ask questions and, and co raise comments and things like this, okay? Because if we don't have feedback, this is gonna be a very, very long semester. But uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll get some. Um, so anyway, what is data science, okay? Um, the way I think of data science is it's an emerging field, okay? And when you have an emerging field, it's not exactly clear what, uh, it's not well-defined what it is. But I think of data science as having kind of three main um, legs that it stands on. One is um, a tradition from exploratory data analysis um, and visualization. How do you take a look at data sets? How do you look at them? How do you find out what they're, make them say what you're gonna be saying? A second thing comes from machine learning and statistics. How do you build models from data? How do you validate how good your model is? Okay, and this is the other intellectual tradition that, uh, that uh, data science comes from. And it also comes from sort of the advances in computing technology, the fact that we can deal with much larger um, data sets than we could have five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, statisticians have been worrying about data for you know hundreds of years, okay? But somehow something different in understanding data happens when the scale gets large enough. And, um, that's, uh, that's what we hope to be dealing with here in data science. Any questions? Can people hear me okay? Can I see some signs? Okay, good. Again, people, people with cameras on that vigorously hold up fingers, this is actually a good, actually hold up hands. Finger, middle fingers are not welcome, but uh, hands are welcome. 
Um, okay, good, that I like to see. Okay, so why is it that data science is kind of an emerging thing? Um, well, the biggest reason I would say is that um, re relatively recent advances in technology have you know, greatly uh, amplified the rate at which people can collect data, you know, interesting data. Um, and store interesting data. I mean, um, you know, data storage capacity in the world doubles every year, two years, small on a very small time scale. Um, you know, everything is being logged. I mean, I'm right now talking about this on uh, um, Zoom. Is everything that I'm that being logged? Well, not only am I being recorded, and that's generating data. I know that there are speech recognition algorithms that they run on this, and I'm going to get a transcript of everything that I said during this uh, during this uh, lecture. Perhaps I will cringe when I read it, but uh, that's another example of data being generated. Um, there's no doubt somebody at the university is keeping track of how many people are attending my lecture, so I'm sure that the counts of of, of these things are being logged. Tremendous! All kinds of new sensors are being logged. Are 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 generating data and logging data you know um to a certain to you know uh, uh, a frighteningly large percentage of our activities are monitored these days okay all of this is turned into data um that is interesting um you know an another thing that is true is like the computing advantages the technology uh, uh to actually do com computations has improved greatly um certainly you guys probably know about machine learning and deep learning and uh you know, GPUs and all of this stuff enables you to do computing on scales that were not possible before. And so the ability to build very specialized models, okay, high performance um, predictive models is a relatively new thing in human history. And that's one of the things that's promoted um, uh, data science. Another thing is that, that um, you know, as of a couple of years ago, data science started getting sexy because there started to be models, you know, role models in the world that you heard about. Um, how many of you ever saw, and this, I fear I'm going to be disappointed, how many people have ever seen the movie Moneyball with Brad Pitt? Okay, I see at least one or two people. What, what was Brad Pitt? Well, Brad Pitt is big star, we like Brad Pitt, but he was playing a uh, baseball executive who used data to, 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 to build a winning team. And the idea that somehow data analysts would be played by people like Brad Pitt didn't exist before 10 years ago, okay? It, it sort of became a uh, thing. Everybody saw how Google kind of turned data into, you know, incredibly accurate searches and, you know, tremendous amounts of money. Hedge funds, okay? Um, one of the, things that everyone should know about Stony Brook is that Stony Brook is the home of Renaissance Technologies. How many people have heard of Renaissance Technologies? A few, but not as many as I think I'm seeing. Um, Renaissance Technologies is, is based in, in Stony Brook. Um, it is one of the world's um, most prominent hedge funds for investing money. Um, and it emerged out of the math department here at Stony Brook by a, a gentleman named Jim Simons, who is a major benefactor of the university. Um, and, you know, basically his, um, you know, Renaissance uses as much data as it can. They hire the smartest data analysts they can. And um, they have, you know, been very, very successful with, um, you know, uh, investing. Okay, unbelievably successful. It's a very interesting story to read about. Um, and in fact, I recommend there is a book that was published about Jim Simons. Um, a couple of, uh, you know, now I'm thinking about it. I'm even gonna spontaneously show you. Uh, where do I have it? Here you go. So if you're interested in making billions of dollars, um, perhaps you would read this book. This is a book about Jim Simons, okay? The Stony Brook uh, math professor turned Quantitate, Quant who founded Renaissance Technologies, and it's about how he used math and data to um, solve the market, okay? And so, so this and many other reasons have kind of made um, uh, data analytics a, a more popular or a sexier thing than it was before. Um, and a gentleman named Nate Silver, who I'll talk about in a minute. 
Um, okay, ah, sorry. Okay. Um, data is something that is not uh, new to computing, okay? And again, by now I think data science is probably fit into your culture. People, I think, understand, you know, if you're a new graduate student, you've probably uh, grown up with the idea of data as being a very important thing. But this is an interesting graph showing, um, in some sense, how much people thought about data as a function of time. What is this? This is a chart from um, a resource called Google Ngrams. Okay, and uh, what did Google do? Google has scanned a sizable fraction of the world's books, perhaps 20% of all the books ever published. And they keep track for, of every short phrase. How many times did it appear in books in a given year? And so what this is showing you is for each of these uh, terms related to computer science, information technology, data processing, data science, um, how often was uh, it used in books in a given year and normalized by the amount of, um, you know, of, 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 of words published in books. So what do you see when you look at this graph, okay? Um, what I see is that computer science, which is the subject that most of us know and love, wasn't really the preferred term of the computing field until about 1980, which is when I got my undergraduate degree. When I was growing up, data science, data processing was the name of what computer people did. They used big mainframes. They, uh, they, they worked for IBM. That was the field. Of, at that point, computing was basically called data processing. This is a term that fell out of favor, okay? And uh, now computer science is the primary term. But notice that the term data science up until, you know, let's say 2012, 2013 was, was a blip, hardly mentioned at all, okay? So this is an kind of a proof that data has always been important to computer science, although perhaps we kind of um, underestimated it with respect to computing power for many years. The emergence of data science is kind of about the rec more about the recognition of that this is an important thing. Any questions so far about anything I've said? And it'd be nice to have some kind of questions. Oh, okay, more. Let's see what I'm doing here. I think uh, chat. Okay, um, okay, oh good, okay, fine. So I see people communicating on the chat a little bit and I think that's a good thing. Um, if people have questions and they are too shy, they can communicate it on the chat. But um, if I, I prefer actually if I get to a point where we can start to talk to each other, okay? Any questions about that? So what is my experience with data? Why am I teaching this? And uh, what, is, uh, what is it how I see that data science is as a subject? Well, again, my original background was in algorithms and um, but over the years, I worked on a variety of projects that did involve careful analysis of data. Um, one thing I did was I developed a gambling system for a sport called high lie that's described in my book, Calculated Bets. And this involved a very, very careful an analysis of statistics in this sport and building predictive models for this sport. Okay, and uh, I've always been interested in this kind of thing. Um, so, and again, so you learn that there's things that make sense, things that don't. I spend a lot of time collaborating with biologists and social scientists, okay? And, um, you know, these, uh, you know, these people have and respect data in a much greater way than um, computer scientists tend to do it. Historically, computer scientists worried about algorithms and the data going through the algorithms was just sausage meat passing through the grinder, okay? But um, in, if you're a biologist and a social scientist, you really care what social, what data means. And uh, by working with them, I developed a, uh, a sense of, you know, being excited in the question of what does data show? How do you make beat data so it talks, okay? That's kind of a, uh, one of the things that kind of drives what I'm, what I'm doing here. Um, 
my research has been um, over the last, you know, probably 10, 15 years, mostly devoted to l large scale text analysis and natural language processing. And here we have, um, again, large text feeds. The, the world is a great place now. There is all of Twitter. There is all of the news that's coming on the web. You know, I have a project. My graduate students are working on a project of analyzing novels, and they have 100,000 books that they can analyze. Okay, so there's interesting things to do. How do you interpret this much data? Make it do some interesting things. Um, I got involved from the text analytics. We developed a couple of startup companies, um, the, the general sentiment and thrive metrics. These did not ultimately succeed, although I do have my uh, general sentiment coffee mug here, which I'm, I'm kind of proud of. Um, but again, we were working there on could we analyze large scale news and social media feeds and identify trends um, where, uh, you know, in trends in the, um, you know, in, in how much companies are talked about. Okay, so basically our clients were advertising, generally uh, product companies that wanted to know uh, in the advertising space, wanted to know what were they thinking about it, um, at, about the company. Okay, like one of our customers was Toyota at a time when uh, their Toyota cars had a problem with their brakes. And how much were people worried about their brakes? How, when did that go away? Um, these kinds of things we could study by analyzing the news feeds. So that was a very interesting thing. And finally, there's, there was another project where um, we analyzed all of Wikipedia, this book, Who's Bigger? where we uh, took a look at every person in Wikipedia, of which there were about 800,000 at the time we did it, and tried to make sense of what is the historical significance of people, okay? And um, so all of this experience and stuff like that is what's kind of driving what I am uh, uh, trying to teach in here, okay? Any questions or comments? Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, so back to the previous slide, uh, I wonder, is it more effective for people in various domains, experts in various domains to learn data science or for people to focus on data science and then uh, pick up various domain knowledge? So, okay, so my general belief is that in, you know, as, as, as a rule of life, okay, there is a um, famous story or uh, essay about the fox and the hedgehog, okay? And um, that there's kind of two different ways that people think. There are um, uh, foxes, oh, actually it's funny, now I'm, now, now I'm getting confused because I don't know which side is which, so this is kind of embarrassing. But, um, but the two different kinds of models were that there's some people who are deeply focused on one thing, and become absolute experts in this, and they know everything that there is to know about that. And there's other people who have relatively broad backgrounds. And generally speaking, I believe in life that breadth is actually more important than depth. Okay, this is my personal belief. So the question of what do I think is good, important to know about data science? I think that everybody should know, um, you know, data, Data, science, data analysis and statistics and, you know, so much of the world is driven by data. It's important that everybody, I think, needs to know about this, okay, on some level. Does everybody need to be an expert? Not necessarily. Just like, and, and the same thing is true outside of computer science. All of the social science peep graduate students I deal with or the biology graduate students, they want to learn some Python and they want to be able to do some, um, uh, you know, uh, data science type analysis, because they know it's kind of an important thing. So I guess the question, uh, um, I think, generally speaking, I think a, a, a broad background in these kind of things is good. If you're a computer science master's student, I think a broad background, you, you should know about systems, you should know about theory, you should know about data science and machine learning. Um, so anyway, that's, I guess, my, my, my pitch there. Any questions or comments about any of this stuff? Um, yes, sir. So uh, the, my question is based more out of my curiosity. So uh, I was reading your book 
uh, in which there is a section which says asking interesting questions from data. And there was a section on baseball, right? And I have no idea about baseball, which made me think that there would be situations in which uh, data scientists are given a problem which they have no idea about or a field where, which they have no idea about. So what I, what I was wondering is, of, like once you're fluent in data science, does, do you reach a point where it's just data to you irrespective of the field, like you see data as just it, or is it expected of the data it does okay. to have a little bit knowledge of each and every domain. Okay, so a couple things. First of all, there's the question of, uh, let, okay, and maybe I'm a long question. I hope I remember all the parts. First question is about the importance of baseball, okay? And uh, uh, I do encourage you all to learn as much as you can about baseball before the next class, um, uh, just because I like to use it as an example. Um, but uh, on the other hand, um, don't take that all that seriously. But um, what, I, what I do think is um, it's important to become curious about data, okay? This is one thing that I think is, uh, if I have to say what is, you know, the most important uh, thing about being a good data scientist, it is about being curious about the world and what data tells you. One of the neat things about a data, uh, about an interesting data set is that it tells stories, okay? And, um, and being able to look at a data set and uh, try to figure out what stories it tells is a, you know, first of all, I think it's a lot of fun. And second of all, I think it's kind of an important thing about curiosity and things like this. Sometimes computer scientists you know, say, I don't want to know the story. I don't want to know where the data is. I just want to pump it through some algorithm. Okay. And I would say that machine learning, there, there are differences in, in, in thinking between what I will say machine learning and data science, even though they're very closely field, closely related fields. I will argue that machine learning, the culture is arguably one, take any data set, run it through my thing, get a high score. And that's what matters. In data science, I think what matters is trying to find what the story that the data is trying to tell you, and um, what you, and uh, you know and 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 support it and see how how you know why you, be be sure why you believe it. Okay, so I do encourage this kind of curiosity. Next class, we'll talk about um, uh, you know uh, how you try to get you know try to find good questions from data sets. But I definitely, this is one of the things that I think is a difference. We're not going to, part of the semester, and you'll see when I go through the lectures, part of the stuff is going to be about machine learning. But frankly, the, the most important parts in here, if you ask me, are, are before you do the machine learning, okay? And uh, that's the part of the class that I'd say is probably different than what you will learn when you take your machine learning or your NLP or your computer vision class. Okay, and I think it's kind of important. That's my belief. But we'll talk more about asking questions from data and things last, last time. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, I see one person asking me on, on uh, the chat. Again, I encourage people asking me uh, over the voice because I like the idea that I'm talking to people. Um, the, yeah, uh, uh, I can say it out loud. Good I man, was just good man. waiting for him to finish. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, like, I was uh, wondering how you can objectively rank historical figures. I mean, the impact or their actions affect different people differently, right? So, someone might be a hero for me, but a, a ghastly villain for someone else. And this can obviously be not just for one person, but an entire population. Okay, so this is this was about our analysis of historical figures, and you know what you're saying is absolutely right. Um, the, you know, so the question is, this is probably part of a good example of, of trying to figure out what the stories are of for, that a data set is telling you. What is it that Wikipedia is telling you about how significant people are? Why are certain people, you know, which people in, in Wikipedia are recognized as the most important, the most in, the ones that are, you know, attracting the most attention, and which are not, and why? So, you know, we we de developed some methods. We'll talk about it more, I think, when I get into the section on scoring functions. 
But um, we developed, you know, rankings of people based on many underlying variables that you would presumably associate with significance, okay? Do we generally think that people with longer Wikipedia articles are more important than people with shorter Wikipedia articles? Okay, Skeena has, is in Wikipedia and Donald Trump is in Wikipedia. Who has the longer article? Okay, I haven't checked recently, but I'm willing to bet you that Donald Trump has a wildly longer article than I do. That is probably a measure of something. How many people are reading the articles? Okay, we would expect that certain people would be more important. We know a, a more important, a more prominent, a more significant figure probably gets their page read more than somebody else's. Okay, um, we would, um, they're, they're measures of centrality. Are the links to a person's page from more or less important people? Okay. If you are uh, the president of the United States, presumably articles from other presidents of the United States presumably link to you, okay? If you're Skeena, who links to you? Well, not that many people and probably not that, 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 that classy in our, a, a, a neighborhood, okay? So you can imagine that there are several different things there that should correlate with ideas of significance. And by doing an analysis of this, we found many interesting things. Um, we found that we could tell the difference between people who were famous sort of as celebrities, okay, versus people who were famous for, um, you know, let's say uh, more traditional, serious, gravitas-based things like politics and, and literature and things like this, okay? So there's a lot that you can kind of do objectively rank, I'm not trying to say better or worse, okay, but more, you know, more prominent is something that seems interesting, okay, and anyway, if, if, if you're interested enough, read the book. We'll talk a little bit about some of it maybe as examples, but, um, but anyway, that's what I was thinking about. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, just as a brief question. For this Wikipedia analysis, this was done over the English Wikipedia, or did it you was done over the English Wikipedia? Okay, okay. and that, that question, was my question. A question from that that's quite interesting is what about bias? Okay, um, it is quite possibly that if I had done this in the, um, uh, you know, in the French Wikipedia or the or or or, or the uh, Hindi Wikipedia, okay this would be, you would get quite different answers, okay? And that's an interesting thing. Knowing, you know, knowing what the <coughs> limitations of the data set are is part of being a good data scientist. It's probably not such a part of a guy who's just pumping something through a machine learning algorithm and trying to get a good score on a, on a held out fraction of it, okay? So part of it is, um, these are the kinds of, I, I, I want it, again, I, I'd like it if people here got excited about dealing with data sets. And that's kind of what, uh, what I'm kind of hoping to, to, to accomplish in here. Okay, any other questions or should I move on? Okay, so what is the textbook in here? This is the textbook, a book called the Data Science Design Manual. I think this is a very good book, okay? And one of the reasons I think that is that I wrote it. Okay, so, uh, so this covers um, what I think uh, is, you know, is the, 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 the basics of, of uh, what data, what, what one needs to know about data, data science, data analysis. And um, we will cover the entire book in here. Um, and I encourage people to read it. Um, the stuff from the book, you know, the, the lectures will generally follow the books, you know, reasonably closely. Um, but, uh, but stuff from the book is fair for quizzes and exams, and I, I encourage you to read it, okay? I think it's, a, it, it's an easy, relatively easy to read book, but I think, it, I, anyway, I strongly encourage it. When I hear from students who have actually read it, okay, they, 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 they feel they get something out of it. So I encourage you to do this. Um, there's two other books that I'd like people to be aware of with varying degrees of seriousness. 
one thing that my, my book, the data science book, book is purely on what I will call conceptual and theoretical, not, not theoretical is maybe too strong, but this is at the concept level. It is not at the programming slash, you know, slash Python level. So this book, you, you're going to need, to, I'm going to assume you guys are graduate students in CS mostly. Um, I'm going to be expecting that you guys are going to be able to teach yourself Python. Um, the, a, a good resource that I find for basic the mechanics of how do you work in Python is this book, Python uh, for Data Analysis. Um, so if you're interested in uh, some kind of a book helping you about, you know, uh, what, what the basic libraries are, um, you know, uh, and, and the mechanics of how you use it, that's, that's my preference. We will have, I, I, I believe, uh, one or maybe two lectures on Python uh, taught by my graduate students at some point during the semester, during, during the coming weeks. Um, but I encourage people to, to, to play around. I happen to like books. You guys figure out how to deal with it. The final thing is not really a book that I am necessarily recommending that you read for, for the course, but maybe just for your edu education. This is a book, The Signal and the Noise, by a guy named Nate Silver, who is an, a very interesting figure. How many people have ever heard of Nate Silver? Is there anybody here who's heard of Nate Silver? I'm seeing one thumb and not too many thumbs. Okay, so who is Nate Silver? Couple, two thumbs, three thumbs. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't know if I have an accurate thumb count here, but uh, okay. Let's say I've got some, some, some number of uh, thumbs. Um, Nate Silver is a, basic, sort, of, sort of hard to describe what he is, but he's kind of a new data science type journalist. Um, he founded a website called 538 that um, became famous uh, for analyzing political polls during an election. One, one exciting thing about taking data science at the time this semester is that there is, as some of you may have noticed, a lot going on in the world. There is an election, and um, we are going to be spending the next couple, of, I, I believe it is three months, constantly hearing polls about um, what's the result of a poll in the presidential race, and who's ahead of whom, and who's gaining on it, and in what states, and who's going to win the election. Um, Nate Silber made his reputation by basically analyzing the collected set of poll data and trying to make accurate predictions of what, what the polls really say. Often people say that polls uh, give, contra you, know, you, you know, don't tell you the truth. They, don't, they're, 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 they contradict each other, okay? And when you read in the news, there's always going to be polls that are saying that one candidate is doing better than the other. And so he made his reputation trying to analyze poll data. And, um, and in fact, if you want my view of who is winning the election or something like that, my view is unimportant. Nate Silver's view is important. So I encourage you guys to go to the, the website 538. Uh, probably after Labor Day, he's going to put up his election model showing you how all the poll data is. But anyway, this book is about his experiences analyzing data and um, why um, basically, you know, how to build good models, not on a, not on a um, what do you call it, on a, on, on a technical level so much, but on, you know, on, on a, a, a fundamental, uh, you know, on kind of a principle level. So I do recommend this for people who are interested in this to read sometimes. It's not going to be uh, discussed in here particularly. I mean, I'll, I'll be talking about Nate Silver at various points during the semester and the presidential data I am sure we'll talk about. Um, the other thing, I guess, the other reason it's exciting times here is of course that this is the time of COVID and the time when there is this epidemic uh, around. And there's all kinds of claims that you're starting, you're hearing about, oh, oh, you know, how effective is a vaccine? Which vaccines are good or bad or should they be approved? Is uh, the, you know, is the play getting better or worse? Should students be coming back to class or not? These are decisions that should be made on the basis of data. 
And it's actually an interesting thing in the world. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of data being collected on COVID and uh, the, the, uh, the spread of the epidemic. And trying to interpret this data to figure out what is the story it's really telling you to make sound decisions. That's the kind of thing that, 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 that I'm interested in. That's not machine learning particularly, although there are all kinds of machine learning epidemiological models that are being built. Okay, but you know, this is the kind of thing that I'd like to think about that makes it a little bit different than this course, a little different than just machine learning. Any questions about the books? Again, I recommend my book. I think my book is great and uh, I encourage everybody to read it uh, uh, as we do this semester. Okay. Um, that said, the rest of my talk here is going to be more mechanical about the logistics of the course. Um, and uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that this is the first time I've taught online. And um, I'm going to need people's patience this semester as we try to figure out, uh, you know, how to do this. Um, uh, you know, and I, what I really want to see is uh, participation in class. Um, so far, I'm a little encouraged. I have seen people, I've seen, you know, these little tiles on my screen speak, and that's a good thing. Uh, I have seen, um, you know, some comments on the chat. I am seeing this. Thing. It's good. I do want to hear it. I do want us to have discussions. The class is being recorded. It will eventually be available in Blackboard and then eventually on the, my YouTube channel. Okay, so, uh, but I encourage people to come live because. This is a course that uh, is best done live. Um, and I will also tell you that when you look at my no lecture slides, I actually have very little stuff on my lecture slides. I kind of count on having discussions, okay, and, and, and going off on tangents in some sense, okay, during the class. I think that makes it very interesting. Um, and that only works if we're going to have the participation. So certainly I hope that that's the case here. Okay, um, one thing that uh, I am particularly concerned about is that uh, this semester I fear, I'm pretty sure and fear that not only are there students that are gonna be remote from Stony Brook, um, they're gonna be some of you that are remote in, um, you know, in different countries this semester. Um, so, we have posted an assignment, Yun Thing, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we have posted an assignment in the Blackboard, okay, where I want you to fill out a survey telling me, it's a one question survey if I am correct, telling me whether you are located in um, Stony Brook or Long Island, um, or you are located somewhere in the United States, but not, you know, Long Island, okay? or if you are remote. Um, and I want to kind of know for reasons of time zone and things like that. Um, you know, uh, the one thing I'm going to encourage, if you are not in this time zone, okay, or not in Stony Brook, it's important that you pick as your project and perhaps some of the homeworks I might allow partners on. I haven't decided yet. But uh, you pick your partner as being in the same time zone as you are, so you can work a little alertly. Um, and, uh, you know, the assignments are all going to be turned in electronically. So in some sense, you can do it at whatever time you're awake in whatever country you are in. But um, the one thing that you'll have to do, let's say, live in synchrony with the class is going to be the um, final exam. So um, I'm going to need you guys to turn in if you're remote and distant. I'm still going to need you to turn in your assignments and quizzes by the same time as everybody else. If the uh, time zones are such that I need to open up the time slot for the quizzes earlier or something like that, let me know. But, uh, but I will need you guys to be in synchronous for the final. Any questions about that? Uh, professor, for uh, doing the uh, project, you said we need to have um, partners in the same time zone. Is that like a requirement or is it just like... Okay, is that a requirement? Okay, it is first of all excellent advice. Let's at least say that it's excellent advice 
that uh, you, you probably want to be doing a partner, have your partner be awake when you are, when you're doing the project. That yeah. said, if this is not, um, you know, if this is not the case, if you have a partner who wants to work with you, who's not in the same time zone, I'm not going to, I'm not going to interfere in any way. I would say that if you are here, it should, you know, I would be reluctant about taking a uh, partner in a wildly different time zone, okay? Because I think it, the synchronous is, it, it's going to be difficult to coordinate. But this is for up to you. So call this a strong suggestion, but it's not a requirement. I'm not going to ultimately demand to know your time zone, okay? But, uh, but it is a suggestion. Any other questions? Okay, good. Um, now, one, we're going to use, uh, okay, so everyone here should, should have presumably gotten the link to the class by, oh, wait, hold on. There's a question about how confident or, uh, okay, some wise, some, some wise guys on the talk, which is fine. How confident, how, how, how confident are we that time zones are synchronized with, uh, correlated with sleep-wake cycles? Um, they're, they're correlated. They're not perfectly correlated. So some of you may be night owls here and then love to work with someone overseas. Um, but anyway, that's something we'll talk about. Okay, good. Um, okay, so what am I saying? The uh, tools, the, the websites you need to be worried about. You need to be worried about, um, you know, uh, Blackboard. That is where, uh, you know, where certain course information is. That's where the links to the lectures will, will probably be. Um, you need to be aware of Google Classroom. Google Classroom is the environment we're going to use to permit, have people upload and uh, 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 upload their assignments to. So uh, I want you to go look at, uh, 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 and, and the other thing we have is there's a website called Piazza. Piazza is where the class discussion board will be. So I encourage you to go to Piazza, okay, and um, what you call it, uh, sign on to Piazza so you make sure you read the class discussion that goes on. Um, I want you to sign on to Google Classroom. Um, and uh, it says, I don't see a Google cla uh, a Classroom link on the syllabus, okay? That's true. Where do you go to get this information? Uh, I believe, okay, to get to the Google Classroom site, I believe you go to the, uh, where, Yanting, where is the easiest place for them to get the classroom site? Uh, they need to go on Google Classroom and they need to sign up for our class using this code, U74YNOO. I, I just posted it in the chat. Okay, so, um, so the, the classroom code has been posted there. I believe I have also posted this on my website, okay, the syllabus for my course. Okay, my, my course website, which I use, is www.cs.stonybrook.edu, okay, slash tilde skina slash 519. And over there, you will see the, uh, you know, um, the information about the code for what the Google Classroom is also over available there. Okay. So, um, and uh, this kind of thing is a perfect thing to discuss on the Piazza. Okay. Um, now, in order to get to the uh, Google Classroom, you have to sign on with your at Stony Brook email. Okay, so this is not everyone in the universe can sign on to uh, my Google Classroom, only the people who are Stony Brook uh, people, because you will have a at Stony Brook uh, .edu address. Any questions about what these, these systems are? Okay, so get familiar with them. What is my lecture, what is going to be the schedule of lectures in this semester? Um, this is a rough outline. Again, I am normally pretty organized about what my, uh, my, uh, um, you know, what the uh, series of lectures are. This year, because it's online and because I don't know the dynamics yet, 
uh, it, it may very well be um, uh, it may very well be something that uh, that that this, the flow of the semester changes a little bit. But basically, what are we going to be talking about? Starting next class, we're going to start to get serious. What is data science? Okay. The first couple of lectures are going to be about kind of the mathematical preliminaries. What is it that you need to know in order to um, do data science? Um, I am going to be having my graduate students give one and probably two introductory lessons on Python. But frankly, if you don't know Python, if you've never used Python, this is something that I encourage you guys to get your, get, get, start playing around with. The students, if you're a typical computer science student, you pick this up relatively easily, but um, uh, I do encourage people to uh, start to play with it. We will talk about correlation, which is kind of, you know, what makes data science interesting is that certain outcomes we care about are correlated with other outcomes, with other things. And exactly how do you compute a correlation and what does a correlation mean? That's something we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how, where does data come from? How do you build a data set? Okay, that is meaningful. And there's some strategies for this kind of thing. We're going to spend time talking about data cleaning. Data cleaning is um, uh, the idea of many data sets when they come in, the raw data is um, messy, contains artifacts, uh, will not give you the right answer. You know, we'll, we'll have will have certain thing, deficiencies in it. And the question of how you take a data set and prepare it so you can do meaningful analysis, that's the cleaning process. We're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, sometime about how we build scores and rankings. This question of, hey, how do you determine, tell how significant somebody is historically, okay? Trying to come up with a meaningful score or a meaning, you know, a meaningful ordering. Okay, from data is, I think, a, 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 a very interesting subject. We'll spend a couple lectures on that. We're going to spend a couple lectures on statistics. What are statistical distributions that you should know about? What does it mean when something is normally distributed and why is that important? We're going to talk about statistical significance. How do you tell whether an observation is important? You know, one of the big issues with COVID right now is um, you know you have plenty of people trying to uh, say that this drug is good for curing COVID, or you have that this this vaccine is going to protect you. What is the evidence of this? Okay, how do you tell that the evidence that you're seeing that this is in fact protective or healing, really is not something that just you got lucky on? Okay. And uh, statistical significance testing is the idea for how you validate those kind of things. Um, we're going to spend a couple lectures on visualization. How do you, um, what you call it? Uh, we're going to do visualization. How is it that uh, you, you take a look at data and, um, you know, basically uh, come up with meaningful presentations of it so other people can understand it. Visualization is an important skill. And, uh, and you know, there is, once you get sensitive to it, there is a um, big, uh, what you call it, there is a big issue, uh, a big difference between a good visualization and a lousy visualization. Um, and that I hope to sensitize you to during the semester. We'll talk a little bit about the philosophies of building models and uh, testing them. Any questions about these subjects? Okay. What other things are we going to talk about? Then afterwards, the second part of the semester is going to be more about um, machine learning -y topics. Okay, we're going to talk about linear algebra, which is the mathematics of matrix. Give a quick review of this, of what you need to know. We'll then talk about various machine learning algorithms. We'll talk about linear regression, which is a very powerful, uh, you know, a, a vanilla, but very powerful um, method for building models. Um, to do that, we're gonna have to understand something about, um, you know, how, uh, you know, machine learning models are trained, okay? Things like stochastic gradient descent, 
and regularization. Um, we'll talk about generalizations of linear regression that are used for classification, logistic regression. We're going to talk about uh, machine learning, about nearest neighbor methods. Okay, one thing that I find very powerful that I think is underused by people is the idea of uh, people, you know, that, that if you want to try to classify the properties of a particular item, it's probably very similar to the properties of items that are, it, it's probably the same as the, the, the items, the classifications of properties that are near it. And um, nearest neighbor methods, I think, are interesting. We'll talk a little bit about clustering. We'll then give a, a quick tour of, of, of several machine learning algorithms, basic machine learning algorithms, things like decision trees and things like that. Um, we're also gonna wanna talk about scale. How do you work with big data and how do you deal with the fact that data comes from people? Um, so my plan is usually I lecture the whole semester um, this time, because of the, uh, partially as a result of the, uh, um, the, you know, what do you call it, the, the teaching online and the way the semester has been scheduled, I am thinking very seriously now that the last week of the semester, after the Thanksgiving break, after they've shut down the university, um, I think people are encouraged to go, not come back after the Thanksgiving break. Um, at the last two weeks, we're going to be doing, uh, uh, the last two classes, we will be having you give project presentations by video, short four-minute videos. And uh, that's what I'm right now thinking. If so, what I am probably going to do is to cram some of this material to bring those last two lectures material in a little bit earlier. Any questions about the lecture schedule? Okay, that's bad. Let me stifle my phone. Okay. Um, hey, one question. Yes. I would like to know how math intensive the course would be uh, when we are talking about al algorithms and how math intensive will the course be? I do not consider this to be a math intensive course. Um, you know, I try to. A good way to tell is to take a look at my book. Okay. My book, I am very proud to say that in my algorithms book, which many of you may be aware of, um, I'm very proud that I never had any theorems in my algorithm book. In my data science book, I have one theorem, but the theorem is incorrect and the proof is wrong. Okay. Um, and that's part of the, that's the only reason why the theorem is actually in the book. But um, so take a look at the, my question, if you're concerned about that, take a look at the, uh, what you call it, the, um, the book and see, see about that. There is, you know, there's, there's some level of math and understanding it, but uh, I don't think I am being uh, particularly technical in here. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Now, um, note that on December 17th is the final exam. Now, um, I have no control of when the final exam is, okay? It happens to be late in the final exam schedule, which is un unfortunate. Um, uh, make sure you are, wherever you are, you are able to attend the final exam. Yeah, again, you're going to be having it be, rem it's going to be remote and online, but I'm going to require everybody, it's going to be synchronous. So no matter where you are on the planet, you will be taking the exam at 8 a.m. Uh, on that day, and it will end at 1045. Okay, so make sure you plan your life that you are uh, able to do that. Any question? Sorry, is that is that 10:45 p.m. Is that a typo or is it actually? That is. Oh, oh, that's great. Yeah, that would be great, wouldn't that be? If I gave you guys a uh, a a 13-hour exam. That okay, I was be... very concerned. Thank you. Okay, so no, that is actually meant to be an a.m. Okay, so I think I think it, it it's a two and a half hour ish exam. Okay, so no, don't worry about that. Any questions? Okay. Um. Again, what am I going to do differently than, as I kind of had said, that than I, from when I usually teach this? One thing I am going to do is I am planning on, uh, what you call it, uh, probably, I'm, I'm warming to this idea, and so I probably will have each group do a uh, four-minute pre-filmed video presentation, okay, for the last week of classes. Um, 
and I will, uh, what you call it, um, like I say, probably compress some of the lecture material if I do that, but the final will cover the entire, everything in the textbook. Okay, um, any questions about that? Yeah, I don't see anything about uh, quizzes in here. Uh, quizzes in where, okay? Uh, like uh, in the lecture schedule or anywhere in the last couple of slides. Um, okay, what I recommend we do then, maybe now is a good point. This is the syllabus for the course. The syllabus is available on my website. Where is, what was my website? My website is www.cs.stonybrook.edu slash tilde skeena slash 519. Um, so all the details of the, uh, the course and stuff like that, the official policies are on the syllabus. And I strongly encourage you to read it. If I were to go through and say, what else did I do that's not on this, that, that, that I haven't talked about in the syllabus? One of the things I haven't talked about was the grade distribution. But that I have a slide for. Um, actually, let me, let me go through this. And if I haven't covered something at the end, let me know. Let me continue to go through it in order. One thing I would like to say is that this is an introduction to data science course. Every once in a while, I have students that come by to me the first day of class and they say, oh, I took the Coursera data science sequence. I took 73 online data science courses before this. And, uh, you know, I have a, uh, you know, done a lot of machine learning and I've done all these kinds of things. Um, you know, if, make, if, if you have an extensive background in these things, okay, Maybe this is not the right course to take. What I encourage you to do is to look at the textbook, look at the notes on the website, look at, uh, you know, people things, okay, to just make sure this is a course that you want to take instead of something else. If you have a tremendous background in these things, the introduction may not be a meaningful thing, okay? So um, you guys think about that. Again, I'd like to think the material in here is not as rocket science-y as it is in many other subjects. A lot of doing data science right is actually avoiding stupid things rather than doing brilliant things, okay? Um, where I think this becomes a graduate student course is largely because of the project, okay? And that there's, uh, my hope is that people will learn to do this stuff on a high enough level when they are given an interesting research project. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, let uh, me I had a question yeah. about uh, the project. Uh, is there any place where I can see the previous projects done by students taking this course in previous semesters? Um, if you go to my website, uh, unless I have succeeded in removing it, it's there, okay? So I encourage you to look through the website and, and browse around and see what's going on there um, to give you some kind of an idea, okay? okay thank you. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, I want some disclaimer. One disclaimer I would like to make is that, uh, again, I like to, this is my first time teaching online. I like to make uh, lectures interesting. I like to make, jokes and analogies, and I often make them on the fly. And sometimes they are insightful and brilliant, and sometimes they miss the, miss the mark. Um, and I'm particularly worried about teaching online this semester, because I'm going to be trying to encourage you guys to be active and excited and stuff like that. And ultimately, I fear I'm talking to a bunch of tiles that have their cameras shut off. Okay, so my fear is I may try too hard or something like this. I want everyone in this class to be comfortable in my classroom. This is important. This is obviously the way it should be. Um, if anything I say comes out wrong and it bothers you, come by and tell me and I will apologize and then uh, make sure I understand it so it doesn't happen again. Any questions about that? Okay, good. Now the course project is a, um, what I consider to be, you know, probably the most important part of the course. Um, we're going to have a, uh, these, these course projects are small group projects. Typically one partner, you know, it would be two people projects, maybe three people projects. Um, and uh, in rare, rare, rare cases, 
you know, maybe it can be a four person project, although that's usually a very bad idea. Um, where the group is going to be doing, you know, there's going to be some kind of a problem involving analyzing a data set, building a data set, analyzing a data set, trying to make something, um, you know, uh, figure out what it says. Now, one thing that is the one good thing about this whole COVID situation is that um, there we have fewer new master students this semester. And the one good thing about that is that my class is now a human size. In past couple of years, I've had 250 people in my class, and that was obscene. And, um, you know, I couldn't let people, for example, choose topics of projects that they were interested in. I had to run this, you know, a, a, a more, you know, more scripted than I would like it to be. Um, so my hope is the one win, unless we have a mass rush of people, okay, into the thing, a hundred is about the threshold where I can offer a more flexible set of projects. I'm hoping we will come in here. If you're registered for this class, tell all your friends that this was a really lousy lecture so that we don't get a big rush over, uh, to get us over that hundred mark. But, um, but I'm hoping that we will be able to have, uh, more more individual and more flexible projects. Any questions about the projects? Uh, um, professor, I have yes. a question. Uh, for students uh, who would like to choose a registered course for CSE uh, 522, uh, is there any difference between the normally take this course as CSE 519? No, so some people are registered for this for 522, uh, my, I, I treat, I, I, I treat the 522 people like they are 519 people. So, uh, so if you are registered for this for 522, um, you, you will be graded just like anybody else. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So I, I told you that the last couple of years, this has been 250 people and that is way too much. Back when I first taught this course, I only had 32 people in the class, okay, back in the ancient days of 2014. And um, what we did was we, uh, I gave each group a, 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 a different project, and I made them film themselves doing the project, okay, because um, I, wanted, I wanted to run the class like it was a reality television show. And um, the... It, it worked out, I thought, really great. Um, I think that the classes, I, I, I had a wonderful time teaching it. We, I gave every class a different, um, every group a different predictive challenge. And um, we filmed the projects and uh, edited them down to 30 minutes. So um, your first homework, which will, uh, is, is the homework assignment available now? Yes. Okay, so if you go on Google Classroom, you can see your first homework assignment which is you've been sentenced to watch four of these videos, okay? Um, again, these videos are not um, gonna, gonna make you miss other forms of television you have watched, okay? The, uh, this is not uh, exactly professional stuff. But on the other hand, it is an example of what happened when you took graduate students, not unlike yourself, gave them a challenge to try to predict something, and um, you can kind of see it. I, I think it's kind of instructive to see what happened to them. Some of them fell into terrible traps, okay? And some of those traps will become clear during the uh, semester. Um, some of them did good jobs. Um, some of them had fun. I'd like people to look at these videos partially just because I think they're kind of fun, but also I think they give us um, shared examples to talk about during the course of the semester. So um, everybody is going to be sentenced to watching four videos of these eight. Um, two of them were assigned based on your university ID. Two, you get a choice of which ones you want to watch. Um, and uh, that's your first assignment. Um, this, I think, is hopefully not going to be a problem. But uh, two years ago, when I had this huge class, the students behave very, very badly in the Piazza online um, uh, posting board. Um, you know, they were posting anonymously, they were calling each other's names, they were, it was really a terrible thing. Um, so your settings on Piazza, I now no longer make anyone, no one's anonymous to me. 
You can be anonymous to each other if you really insist, although I, I do encourage people to uh, not say things they need to hide under anonymity for. Um, if I hear of problems of people, uh, you know, um, speaking badly about uh, other students, this is something that uh, I, I will take seriously. Um, I made a big threat about this to last year's class and everyone was, was, was well behaved. So I'm, I'm not as grumpy perhaps as, I, I'm, as I'm sounding here. But uh, an example of the kinds of discussions that I had that, that, that were during the bad year were about students here. This is the kind of dialogue that I was getting from my graduate students about calling each other idiots and stupid and stuff like that. This is not what we do in here. Any questions about that? Okay, and uh, and uh, again, the, I have notes about these things. I don't think it's going to be a problem. Okay, um, as far as academic grading, um, about 45% of the course grade is on the project. Um, there is a uh, group, um, what do you It's a group project. Um, the, 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 you're going to get graded, you're going to have to turn in a proposal, you're going to have to turn in a progress report, and you're going to have to turn in a final report, okay? Um, there's going to probably be the four-minute video presentation. Um, there is a chance I'm going to use peer grading. I'm not sure about it. This is a class size issue. So you, there's a chance I, I may have you look at other people's projects and grade them as well. Um, but we'll talk about that later. Um, the important thing is that their final exam is worth 25%. The total of all the daily quizzes is 8%. Is 8% a big number or a small number? Okay. How many quizzes are there? Well, there's going to be one every class. So that means 8% divided by um, figure about 25. Is that a big number or a small number? It is a small number, okay? And so um, if for some reason you get hit by a car and you can't make one of the quizzes, okay? It's not a big deal, okay? But the quizzes are gonna be open for several hours before every class. This, the reason I have the quizzes, the quizzes are not hard. They're basically just giving you a chance to review what was done in the previous class and uh, look at it a little bit. One thing that's true, because we're having the course project, um, I don't want there to be homework assignments testing what we did in the lecture. The lectures are gonna kind of proceed and not really be tested until the final exam. The quizzes are one way to kind of just make sure you're paying attention to the course as it's going along, okay? And um, you know, the TAs and the students always think ultimately this is a good thing. The rest of the credit in the course comes from three homework assignments um, where we're gonna be solving basically Kegel challenges, okay? Um, to uh, learn some lessons and get some experience before the projects. Any questions about the grading? Okay, one thing that I want um, people to understand is that when I am grading a project, okay, I am reading a paper and I am making an opinion on it. This is somewhat subjective. This is not a mechanically graded thing, okay? I have opinions. Are my opinions of how good your paper, is it always right? Well, not always right, okay? But um, it's the best that we've got in here. So um, recognize that this is not a grade where there's gonna be a mechanical grading. If I ask you to do a cable challenge, your, your grade is not going to be based on how, whether you got the highest number or whether you got it quote unquote right. Okay. So, you know, if this bothers you, take a different class. Okay. I try to do things to make the uh, scores grading consistent, and I think I'm pretty good at it. That's one reason why we have a lot of different checkpoints. There is a, a, a proposal and a progress report and a final report. So I get three chances to grade it you, and then and, and it'll the errors kind of cancel, okay? So um, understand that I have ways of doing it that the grades come out reasonably consistent, okay? The figures on the left I show you a 
uh, matrix of pairwise correlations between in last year's class, how did the score people got on the homework assignments correlate with their quiz grades? Well, point four, again, correlations, as we'll know, if one could perfectly predict the other from it, it would be a correlation of one. But all of these correlations are positive. All of these correlations are reasonably good. That tells me that they all kind of measure how good the student is. And when you combine them, you end up with a reasonably accurate vision of how the student goes. Any questions about it? Okay, so I, I like to interact with students. The grading discussions make me unhappy. So I, so I want people to understand that. If you're not happy with um, the way we're gonna be grading this kind of thing, I want you to take a different class. Um, one thing is that I, I believe very much is that grading errors are unbiased, okay? If I am gonna be taking a look at a paper, I don't know who you are, okay? Maybe I will be in a grumpy mood that day or maybe I'll be in a great mood that day, okay? But the next time I read your next paper, it's likely to be that if I was in a grumpy mood before, I'll be happy now. These kind of errors, I believe, cancel out. They are unbiased. They correct over the course of a lot of things. One thing I find is that regrade complaints tend to come from aggressive students. And that when, when somebody is complaining about an error in their paper, okay, what, they, what is the case is it is no longer an unbiased thing. Grumpier people or, or more aggressive people complain more, okay? And if I give in to those regrade requests, it ends up giving a bias where those students end up doing better than, 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 than the rest of the mark. This is why I don't allow regrading on the homeworks, the quizzes, the projects, things like that. There's enough different measurements that we capture things, and I think we do a good thing. If this bothers you, you should take a different class. Any questions about that? Okay, again, that's kind of the thing. I don't like to hear complaints about the thing. I, I very much want to interact with you on the level of G is subject, what's going on. I don't want to interact with you on the levels of grades. Um, and because this is a large class, we don't end up uh, giving extensions on things, okay? Um, you know, again, if you're in a hospital, okay, or there's really a family emergency, you have to go home or some, which sometimes happens, unfortunately, during the course of a semester in a big class, okay? that kind of thing uh, will happen. Um, questions, I see some questions on the, the thing about the final exam. The final exam is a book written exam, okay? So it will be about prob solving problems from the exercises analogous to those in the back of the textbook. So the final exam is a good thing, this way to study for it is by reading the book. Any questions about that? Any questions about any of these grading issues? Okay. Actually, I don't mean to be grumpy. At this point, I'm actually kind of excited the semester is happening. Um, my, uh, you know, last year's class was pretty good. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, working with you guys and dealing with you guys. And um, so I, I certainly hope this will be a good semester. Any questions now about the syllabus or um, anything else? Were there any questions that I didn't get to? Uh, it's fine, let me look at the chat box a little bit. Um, are there any other questions in the uh, chat box that's important? Um, yes, the question is about what is the grading scheme gonna be in this class? Now again, I, t I typically award 25% uh, of the students A's, I award 25% of the students A minuses, I award 25% of the students as B, B pluses, I award 25% of the students Bs, okay? Then there are a sm small number of bad eggs. These are the ones, if, these are, if you're a student who's basically doing the assignments, taking the tests, doing the final, that's what I do. Occasionally there are, are bad eggs who don't do the assignments, don't do the, uh, the uh, project, uh, do you know, phenomenally terribly on the exam, and those people I will consider giving lower to. But that's my usual grading scheme. Again, understand that, you know, 
realize if we do a distribution, what is the distribution of grades going to be like on the performance in the class? Does anyone want to take a guess if we have, that this is going to be your performance and this is the frequency. What do you think the class's performance is going to look like in terms of ability and how they do on the assignments? Normal. Yes, I think it, if I have a normal class, I'm going to have a normal distribution. So what is the consequence of my grading scheme? Well, there is a middle of the distribution. These are the people who are going to be getting some form of A-ish. These are the people who will get some form of B-ish, right? Where is the A and A minus thing? Well, it is probably going to look something like this. Does everybody kind of see that? So unfortunately, there are not necessarily extremely clear boundaries between where these letter grades are given. But that is life. That is the way the statistics work. If that troubles you, you should take a different class, okay? But uh, this is the way that it usually works out. I work very hard to try to make the grades mean what I want them to mean, okay? That's why there was a high correlation between the assignments, okay? But I want you to trust me on that. Any other questions about anything? Yeah, I actually have a question about the first homework. What? You mentioned that some of them were assigned by our ID number, but I can't seem to find anything that would indicate that. Okay. Um, what I believe is that uh, I am... Okay, let's just see. Did, did we post the... Uh, if you go... I will... After, when I get a chance to take a look at it, I will ha make sure that homework one is visible on our web, my class website. And there I will show you we, that uh, based on a certain fraction of your, um, uh, 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 on what the last two digits of your ID number, which projects you should do. In fact, there's now a note on that on the uh, chat box. Okay, so if the last two digits of your ID number are there, it tells you which, which pro television programs to watch. All right. My, my dad, I must have missed it. Thank you. The other two you can do. Any other questions? Uh, professor, on the homework, on the topic of the homework itself, so we are supposed to watch two episodes based on our ID number, and then we have to make a review form for individually for both of them, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to bring it to your notice that the attachment is, I'm not able to access it. So it says unavailable. So I don't know if it will be available later, but okay. it says unavailable. What I recommend is if you have these questions, uh, cor correspond with, um, uh, right place to have these discussions is in Piazza. Okay. okay. So if okay. you're having problems with these kind of mechanics, we will solve it. Or it sounds like even the rest of the class, if somebody else can figure it out, they can answer it too. Okay. Sure. So if you're having a problem, um, uh, work that out on, on Piazza. Any questions? Uh, professor, so the, uh, so from what I understand, if we have to submit the form, the Google form that is attached uh, on Google Classroom uh, four times, once for, uh, you know, each video, right, that we watch? Basically, yes. Okay. Okay. And the mechanics will be obvious. If you want to discuss mechanics, that will be in uh, best discussed in... Um, what you call it, over Piazza. Any questions? If not, nice to meet you all, and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys on Thursday, okay? Take care, and see you guys next class.